Joshua chapter 1. I'd like to read the first nine verses. Please follow along as I read. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's a starting place in this passage. And it's a difficult place to start. And it has to do with the judgment of God. God is bringing judgment to the people in the land. And it's not a, it's not a flip, flippant, casual, random response on the part of God. It's been coming for hundreds and hundreds of years. The people of the land have been taking part in child sacrifices terrible immorality, atrocities to other people groups and other nations. And in an act of justice and judgment, God is removing those people from the land. And he's giving the land to the children of Israel. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, perhaps the greatest leader of all time outside of Jesus himself, is being told to go in and take this land. And this is not the first time that God has told the children of Israel to do this. They, they, were, they were given this command, this opportunity, 40 years earlier. And they shrank back in fear. They sent 12 spies into the land to spy out the land. And they came back and 10 of those spies said, it's just too difficult, we can't do it. They're too established. The people of the land are too, too much. And so they disobeyed God. And then the judgment of God was placed upon that generation because of their lack of faith and disobedience to God. And God told them, you'll wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And I'm going to remove an entire generation. Now, I share this with you because... Honestly, there would be a temptation to come to this passage and to, to try to skirt around that difficult issue. And the reality is that as if I'm your pastor or if I'm standing to speak as a pastor, if I, if I fall to that temptation, I, I do a great injustice to you. And the first truth that you need to know is that God judges sin. And that... God has basically two choices from a human perspective. Forgive this very simplistic human explanation. But God can either 
God can either judge sin, which inevitably leads to wiping all of us out, or God can ignore sin and therefore, as a result, become sinful like us. And God looked at those two alternatives and said, it's not an option for me not to judge sin, so I'm going to take all, uh, all of, the, of my judgment and wrath against sin and I'm going to place it on myself in the person of my son. This is an amazing mercy of God, an amazing demonstration of the love of God that, that Jesus, the son of God, would take my judgment upon himself. So the first, the first truth, the starting place for us is that God judges sin. But there's another truth that's on display here in this passage. It's a very, it's a very rich, redemptive theme, and that is that God is bringing restoration to all things. That from the moment mankind sin, sinned and rejected God and fell from God's grace, God set about to reclaim, to renovate, to restore, to resurrect his entire creation. And what we're reading about in Joshua 1 is the plan of God, uh, a portion of the plan of God as God is on his restoration project. God wants to restore your life. God wants to restore you completely. He not only wants to restore you and everything about you, he is calling you to be a part of his restoration. He's calling you on mission. He's calling you to be a part of reclaiming his universe for himself. And so when we read in this passage, God telling Joshua to go and to take the land, I I want you to think about now your place in the history of God and the call of God on your life to go and possess and to reclaim and to restore as God calls you to that very dramatic calling. And I, I uh, if you've been here for any length of time, you've, you've heard me maybe reference this chapter because... I think about the third or fourth, maybe the fifth time, God tells Joshua, don't be afraid. If I'm Joshua, I'm really afraid. <laughs> right? Be strong. Be very courageous. There are times when you need to hear this word, be strong. Be courageous. What God has for you and what God wants to do in your life will not come easily. It will take spiritual battle. It will take faith. It will take strength. It will take perseverance. Many of you, I think today even, you find yourself in a battle and there are ups and downs in that battle. And some days you feel like you're winning and say, some days you feel like you're running. Be strong. Be very courageous. It's the word of the Lord to us. But it's not the only word of the Lord in this passage. It's really, you're really in trouble if you don't hear the whole passage because the reason God can say to Joshua, the reason God can say to you, be strong and very courageous is because God says, I'm with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Everywhere you go, in taking that which I have for you, I am with you. And so God gives us this command, but he gives us this promise. In fact, I really want to look at this passage in terms of, in terms of what God requires of you and what God promises to do. Let's look at it in these two parts, if we could. First, what you must do. And I'm going to give it to you in four points, and I'm going to keep it really simple so that we can grab a hold of it. You must go, he tells Joshua, go, possess the land. And this very descriptive phrase, every, every place that you set your foot, I'm going to give to you. But you have to go. Very clearly, he tells them to be in the word of God, to meditate on the word of God, to mutter 
to repeat to yourself over and over, to meditate upon, to reflect upon the Word of God. He tells them to obey the Word of God, to do God's Word. And then there's a final word on unity that I didn't read the, the, the entire chapter, but after the portion that we read, Joshua begins to assemble the people and prepare them to go in. And there are two and a half tribes that have already possessed their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. And so he, he goes to those two and a half tribes and he says, listen, you cannot stay here and stay comfortable while we go in to possess what God has promised to all of us. You have to go with us. And they said, yeah, we're with you. We will go with you. It's an important message that when we get the we, we, we understand God's call on our lives. It's not just an individualistic call. God is not just restoring me personally. He's restoring us. He wants, he wants us to take everyone with us. And it's, it's helpful to understand that, that everywhere in my life where I'm holding on to exclusive language that is not exclusive in Christ but in other subjective things that I should be careful. And so God calls us to do these, these four, four things. He commands us to do these four things. So uh, there's a... Uh, there's a, a play that is uh, just, just coming out it's a one-person play on, actually, on bravery. It's called Accidentally Brave. It's written by Maddie Corman, who is right, right about 50 years of age, and she's an actress. And years ago, Maddie had been married for a number of years and had a, a teenage daughter and she was driving, and she received a call from that daughter who told her that her dad, Maddie's husband, had been arrested for the unthinkable. That the FBI had shown up, taken everything, and that he'd been arrested for child pornography. And the story that is told in this one-person play, Accidentally Brave, is her autobiography of that experience. And she tells about picking up her husband when he's released on bond, picking him up on a street corner in Brooklyn and asking him, is it true? He says, yes, it's true. Asking him a second question, have you touched anyone? He says, no, he swears that he hasn't. She punches him and pulls over and throws up. Her story is entitled Accidentally Brave because over and over as the years progress, she chooses to try to get help for her husband and restore her marriage. And today they're together. Spoiler alert if you go see the play. And I thought about this woman and I thought about, here's what... Here's what grabbed me as I read a little bit about her story. As the play's about to be released, she said, you know, people have said the dumbest things to me. And they text the most ridiculous things. But the one thing that was, that was told to her over and over and over again was, you're so brave. You're so brave. But she said, actually, what I feel is fear. I feel so much fear because I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to tell my story. I'm trying to seek restoration. And I'm afraid, how is this going to affect my kids? And will this make it even more difficult for them? And, and will this look like I'm somehow condoning what my husband's done? And, and this actress, this author, she was a part of the Me Too movement. She was a victim of, 
of a sexual attack, and she was one of nine women that came out publicly against a playwright. And so then she had this fear of, like, is this going to undermine what, we, what I've tried to do as I've tried to expose this abuse of authority? And I thought, that's such a... You can feel the emotion of it, right? The courage it takes just to stay engaged in the battle. So for you, I, I want to tell you, um, th there's not a call here to be accidentally brave. There's a call here to be intentionally brave. To know the nature of the battle before you get into it and to know what it is that you're to do and to know what is at there, there for your benefit to help you. So we have to, we have to go. <laughs> we, ha we have to step out. W William Wilberforce, you may be familiar with the story of his life. Uh, he, he probably more than any other individual single-handedly, though he partnered with many, many people, ended slavery in Great Britain. It was a lifelong pursuit for him. It took him 46 years. He was a politician. His entire political career was spent fighting the African slave trade. He actually won the battle on his deathbed. And the bill, as he, as he landed on, in the deathbed, a bed he would not rise from, he received word of victory. On the day he died, three days later, it was signed into law. It's an amazing story. But what many people don't know about William Wilberforce is his entire life was given to a pursuit of helping people. At one moment in his life, he was involved in 69 initiatives to do good to others. He was not a one candidate, I mean a one issue candidate. It cost him politically because he gave his life to this pursuit. Many, many thought that Wilberforce would be the youngest prime minister ever in the history of Great Britain. It, ten, it, it, it didn't happen. He never became prime minister, largely because of his alignment with this one purpose to end slavery. His best friend, William Pitt, did become the youngest prime minister ever. Wilberforce, it was said by one of his close friends that he was as fatal to dullness as he was to immorality. He himself said, no man has a right to be idle. And his life, all these decades, hundreds of years later, stands to you and me and says, listen, in, in, in a world where there's so much suffering, so much pain, so much misery, go. Go and give your life in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and helping hurting people. We have to go. Now, I understand that Scripture tells us sometimes we're to wait on God, and we even, we even celebrated today resting in the presence of God, resting on the promises of God, waiting on God, it's a strong biblical truth, but let me just offer just a, a word of interpretation here of that. When we talk about waiting, what really the warning here is not, not getting out in front of God or doing something that God isn't yet doing. It, it just means believing, standing that God is doing what he promised to do and take the next step, but don't create steps that God's not actually inviting you to do. So let me just say a word about this be in the word and obey the word. Uh, first, what, what God will do, God gives you his promises, God gives you his word, God gives you his presence. So let's, let's move through this real quick. Go, be in the word, obey, unity. Notice Joshua 1.8. This is a key verse for us. Uh, this is a little strange, right? You're a military leader. You're about to go into battle. And this is the strategy that God gives you. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. 
so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. He says, listen, focus on my word. Get in my word. Obey my word. Do what I've commanded you. Follow me. This is what is essential for you to win the battle. I personally, had I been giving Joshua instructions, I would have said, listen, Joshua, there are a lot of things to be afraid of. Be careful. Be careful. Don't get too close to the wall when you go up to Jericho. Right? Have a good battle plan. This is really generally the style my parenting takes. Son, daughter, you have no idea what, what's out there. You, you need to be careful. You have every reason to be afraid. You should run for your life. <laughs> Such a danger to just raise a bunch of cowards. Right? It's true in church life. It's true in family. It's true in work. It's true in every arena. There is a place where we have to release people to go even though they're going to fall. And what we really need to tell them is know the word of God and obey the word of God. So, just a few verses to reinforce this. Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. God gives direction in that, in the cloudiness, in the haziness of what do I do in the midst of the battle, God's word gives me direction. Wilberforce memorized the entire psalm, longest chapter in all of the Bible, and he would quote it Every day as he walked home from, from, from Parliament to his place of residence, he would quote the entire psalm, and it took him about the entire length of his trip to get through it. And the entire theme of Psalm 119 is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The, the scripture is God's word for, for you and me. And there's this picture where we're told that it's profitable for teaching. It tells us how to live. Just picture this straight line. And then when we f fall off of this line, it's, it's profitable for reproof. It's, it, it, rebukes us and says, you know what? You're not on God's path. You're off God's path. But it doesn't leave us there. It corrects us. It shows us how to get back onto God's path and then instruction in righteousness. So this is a picture. This is how we live. When we get off of the path, it, 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 it's, it comes to us as this warning, this rebuff. It redirects us and then tells us how to get back on God's path and then gives us clear instruction on how we, how we should live. So we're to go. We're to be in the Word. We're to obey the Word. And we're not to do this just individualistically. We're to do it as a part of the family of God that we're a part of. Now, if we just did part one, we would be in big trouble. But we need the promises of God, the Word of God, and the presence of God. Now, what's par partially amazing to me is... God begins this conversation with Joshua with a promise that is about 500 years old, a promise initially given to Abraham. And he says, listen, my word is true. I fulfill, I always fulfill my word. Stand on my promises. And there is a, there's a little bit of work that we have to do sometimes when we, when we think about the promises of God. I mean, there's a place where you, you need to be careful. In the first battle, Joshua goes in and they're told to march around Jericho seven times and, and then on the you know, seven days in a row and on the seventh day to march seven times. And they're given all this specific instruction about how God wants to bring the victory and there's a whole lesson there. I don't think you're supposed to read about the battle of Jericho and then every time you, you want something, you do a little Jericho march, right? You're down at the car dealer walking around seven days, you know, <laughs> seventh day, seven times. It's, 
It's, it's probably not a promise given to you for that purpose. There is a place, though, where you glean the promises of God and you see the character of God revealed even in what he told Joshua to do at Jericho. And you stand on that. You stand on who God is and how that's applying to your life. There's a place where you can say, God, you will provide. You have promised it. You will never leave me. You will show me what I need. Your promises are true. It's not just that, that we have God's promise, and it's not just that we're to meditate on the Word and obey the Word, but the Word itself is the power of God coming into our lives. So that we, we read, for example, in Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the, and the intentions of the heart. So helpful when we are, when we when we find ourselves in life, just progressing through and all of the ups and downs, where God's word will just come to us and reveal what's going on in our hearts, reveal to us things that we'd have no other way of knowing that are happening in the situation where, where we humbly receive from God by the power of God's word. Probably, you probably tire of hearing me say how many times in, in, in my relationship with my wife or in with, with one of my kids, I, I, I just be before the Lord and be going through some scripture and, and God's word will just pierce and penetrate and reveal and expose and convict and humble and say, listen, you, you are blind to your own words, your own attitude, your own tone, your own pride, your own your own insufficiency. You're actually, you're actually not the solution, Brian, right now. You're the problem. And, 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 and the glorious freedom that comes when you're there in that place and you say, God, forgive me and I receive forgiveness because of the promise of Jesus Christ that all of the judgment I deserve was poured out on Him and I'm forgiven because of what He's done. And even, even the joy to know that in raising my kids and in being a pastor and whatever the sphere is to say, it's, it's, it's ultimately on you, Lord. You have promised and you are faithful. I will stand on these promises. The big fear for me, when I, when I hit 40, Two or three years ago. <laughs> when I hit 40, I had this incident where I collapsed in the middle of the night. Paramedics showed up. I told them I had the flu. They told me I was an idiot. I didn't have the flu to stop diagnosing myself. And they told me maybe I had some cardiac problems. And I went through a bunch of tests. And it was the most unsettling thing. I, we didn't know what it was. And I went home and I was laying in bed at night. And I'm like... Is it, you know, am I okay? Is it beating? Am I, is it going to stop beating? And this was the fear that attacked me. It wasn't so much dying. It was my kids. Well, will they be okay? Right? Now, I didn't want to die. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't ready. There are days now where it seems more attractive. Amen, brother. Yes. <laughs> Preach it. Okay, so I, the, Lord, I, the Lord is so kind. Right? The presence of God. The Lord met me one night, just, I, I can't even explain it, saying, I am a better father than you will ever be. And if I choose to take you, I'll raise your kids. I told Beth that the next morning at breakfast. She's like, shut up. <laughs> right? God is faithful, friend. You can't do this. You can't obey God. That doesn't mean you... Here's the, here's, here's the problem. You must obey God. And you can't. But you must. And you will if you'll, if you'll stand on the promises of God. And when you fail, and you will, you, you confess and you get up. But there's a, listen, there's a problem if I tell you, okay, 
You're going to fail. Jesus has done it. Listen, I don't want to remove the sting from you that tells you, hold to the word of God. Right now, mom, right now, dad, your kids know if you stand on the word of God. Yeah, you're, you're very imperfect in how you keep it, but they know whether or not the word of God is the foundation for your life and your home. And if it's not, here's the beauty of the good news of Jesus Christ. Repent, confess, repent to them, and start over in Jesus. Now, just we'll end. Oh, this is so good. Let me just give you this verse. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. This is Paul talking about his own ministry. He says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. Right now, I want to take this top sentence. And just announce it to the entire church in the Western world. For what we proclaim is not ourselves. But Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. There's a movement right now. Can I just tell you? Now what social media has done is... is, 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 is we're telling pastors... You're the brand, and you have to build your brand. And, and when, when Christian authors go to publishers, many times Christian publishers are saying to those authors, listen, we won't even look at a book to publish by you unless you have so many followers on social media. And I just want to say, they would not have published the Apostle Paul. Because he refused to be the brand. You are not the brand. It's Jesus. We proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake. For God. Now here's, just grab a hold of this. For God who said, let Light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give us the light, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, the word of God that spoke the worlds into existence. Now, the word of God that you unfold in the scripture speaks and God creates. And what happens is you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ as God's power fills your inner being. Stay close to the word of God, that Christ might be revealed, that you might receive his power. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. We sang that today. All the promises that we stand on are yes in him. Let me end with this. Flannery O'Connor tells a story about two little girls who... The, the nun at the convent where they went to school told them that they were the temple of the Holy Spirit. And these two little girls made fun and mocked what the nun had said. And they left saying, oh, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're temple number one. I'm temple number two. And they, they, they ridiculed the nun and made fun of what she was saying. They came home and they were, they were really vain. And they were, they, were, they were young and young teenagers maybe. And they were... They were boy crazy, and uh, as Flannery O'Connor tells the story, and they went to a fair. And in that day, there's a terrible practice where certain people that were different would, would be paraded in front of others to gawk at. And so they, they went into one of these tents, these two little girls, and there was someone who was terribly disfigured disfigured, excuse me. And this person stood on the stage and in her own words, she proclaimed the truth that the nun had proclaimed. She said, listen, don't laugh at me. This is the way God made me. Don't laugh at me. I'm a child of God. 
So right there, there's this, like, this powerful contrast of someone who thinks this is a truth to be ridiculed, but someone else who knows the deepest rejection is saying, I am a child of God. The Word of God bringing transformation. These two little girls go home. They go to bed that night, and there's a younger girl in the room, and you don't even realize that she's of any consequence to the whole story. She's mean. She's super smart, maybe smarter than all the rest, but very spiteful. She's experienced a lot of rejection herself. And she hears, she hears the girls making fun. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, temple one, temple two. And she hears all of that. And then she hears a story about this disfigured woman. And this little girl, as she hears this convoluted testimony from the word of God, She begins with tears running down her face saying, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm a child of God. And she imagines a whole choir, a whole celestial choir singing over her, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is renovating, he's restoring human lives. He is restoring his creation. He is, When we talk about God's word, God's promises, God's presence, that culminates now with the Holy Spirit of God Almighty living in you so that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit now marshaled to go forward to be a part of the restoration that God calls us to. 